That's good. You're good. Thank you. All right, so everybody, welcome. Um, thanks for having me, and I'm so glad to be back in person. So glad to see all of you. It's great. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm JD Flynn. My job title is senior software engineer, but I'm just a Drupal developer. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at JD Does Dev. On any Slack, I go as Dorf. And if you're going to tweet about this, FLDC, it's 2022, right? That's not just 22? 2022. Okay. All right, so before we begin, how many of you have used Docker before or are familiar with it? Okay. Uh, so you're going to get the most out of this if you're familiar with some basic, very basic program concepts and if you're familiar with moving around the command line a little bit. Uh, this is an intro level section. We're not going to go too deep into it, but just to kind of explore what Docker is, the history of it. Uh, so if you're a Docker expert, then you might get bored and want to leave, or you might be tempted to correct me, uh, and either of those are acceptable. So we're going to talk about Docker, but first, before we can talk about Docker, we're going to talk about me. Um, I've been doing Drupal and PHP for about seven years now, probably a little bit longer. I've been doing HTML since the 90s. Uh, I started learning basic around the same time, and that's uh, I picked that up by a magazine called 321 Contact that had programs written in the back that you would copy from a text page onto your computer by hand, and that helped me out with learning a lot of debugging stuff. So that was my intro. Uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, I became a Doxel maintainer and developer advocate. So when it comes to Docker-based applications, I'm pretty biased. Uh, just be for full disclosure there. But before we can talk about Docker, we need to talk about Bruno. I'm, I'm kidding, we don't talk about Bruno. And well, we're not going to get too into the weeds here, but we wouldn't have Docker without Linux containers. So Linux containers um, stemmed from something created by Google and its engineers in 2013 called control groups or C groups. These allow isolation and control of and limitation of resource usage for user processes. And going further, these processes can be grouped together into namespaces to share resource limitations. Now, what makes C groups work? We'll get the PID namespaces, network namespaces, mount namespaces, and user namespaces. Now the PID, or process identifier, they ensure that processes within one namespace are not aware of processes in other namespace, so they're contained. Network namespaces isolate network interface controller, IP tables, routing tables, and other networking tools built in, so they're contained. Mount namespaces are where file systems are mounted so that the file system scope of namespace limited only to the directories mounted or contained. Hopefully you're picking up a, a trend here. User namespaces limit the users within a namespace to only that namespace and avoids user ID conflicts across namespaces so the users are contained. Now the C groups cleared a path for Linux containers by creating virtual environments. With all those namespaces we talked about before, they are containing everything separately from other namespaces on a system. So now we're actually going to get into Docker basics. What is Docker? Well, in short, Docker provides an environment and workflow for Linux containers. Um, one thing that I had a hard time wrapping my head around is that Docker is not containers. Maybe synonymous, but Docker does not mean container. It, what Docker does is accommodates the containers, it creates a warm, welcoming environment for them, and keeps them all working in sync. Uh, I like the insect bug analogy where all Docker containers are Linux containers, but not all Linux containers are Docker containers. So really, what does Docker do? I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about how it works. That's how it works. Thanks for coming, I hope you enjoy the camp. It's been... <laughs> Okay, so on the last slide, it's built on multiple components. So let's talk about them. We've got the client, the daemon, images, containers, storage, services, registries. These all go into uh, making Docker work and communicate with the containers. Now the Docker client, this is what you use. This is what we communicate with. 
And one thing to remember too that didn't make sense to me for a while, but it does now after putting this together, is that if you have a Mac or Windows and you use the Docker desktop app, that's not Docker itself. What that is, is it creates a virtual machine that can run the Docker daemon. Um, like I said, Docker is built on Linux containers, and if you have a Mac or Windows, they're not running Linux ordinarily. Well, Windows is kind of iffy depending on the WSL, but uh, it creates a virtual machine. That's what's running Docker, or that's what's communicating with the Docker daemon. But a client is responsible for everything that the containers do, and it is available for most common operating systems. On Linux, it can run native on Windows and Mac. Excuse me. Uh, you have Docker Desktop that provides a virtual machine. Now it can be on the same host as a daemon, or it can connect to a remote. So you can have the client on your computer or and reach out to a different Docker instance and run commands that way. Uh, it provides the command line interface to start, stop, build, and execute commands within the containers. And the way it does that is through a REST API communicating with the daemon. Another main use of it is it pulls images and runs them on the host. Uh, so we'll talk about images in a little bit here, but first we're going to talk about the demon. And it is pronounced demon, not dayman, fighter of the nightman. Anybody catch that joke? It's always sunny in Philadelphia. It's a good episode. All right, so the demon is where the magic really starts to happen. It's where applications and containers are run. It's where the images and the containers live. Um, it's where volumes are defined, networks are connected, and the client sends commands to the daemon through REST API calls or through direct interaction. Like I said, it could happen on either the host machine uh, where the client can talk to the daemon on the host or it could talk to a daemon on a remote machine. So Docker containers, uh, I had a hard time deciding whether or not to talk about, or whether to talk about containers or images first because it's a chicken and egg. So we're gonna talk about containers first. I'm gonna say image a lot, but we're gonna talk about images next. So a container itself is a self-contained application that runs on a shared kernel. And what I mean by kernel is, like the Docker desktop, you've got the virtual machine, the kernel is running, uh, base, the basis of an operating system to communicate with the machine work, so, but it's all shared across any containers. And it could be something extremely small, like Hello World, um, or it could be as complex as a fully functioning operating system. Full graphical interface, uh, you can containerize full Ubuntu with uh, GNOME and everything running in it, if you were so inclined. Now, some things about containers is they can be read-write. Uh, you can save data to a, keep, to a container and keep it for as long as the container is running, but only as long as the container is running. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Containers also allow for standardization which means they can be shared easily through images. Uh, so everybody on a project pulling down the same container, pulling down the same image, will have the same environment to work from to start with. They're also isolated. One container will not interrupt another container. That's also based on the system resources. If you've got 17 containers running, each of them taking two gigs of RAM, they might interrupt the other one just because they don't have, there's not enough RAM to uh, share between them. They are extremely lightweight, I mean storage-wise, resource-wise, when compared to a virtual machine. Containers share a kernel. Every container that you have running at one time shares a kernel, and that virtualizes the operating system so that you can run isolated processes where virtual machines themselves virtualize an entire machine from the hardware level up. A little bit more, they're, they're portable. You can share an image or a Docker file to build an image, and that'll build a container that can be recreated identically anywhere that Docker is available. It's not permanent. Uh, I mentioned before that storage will only, or it's read-write as long as the container is running. If the container is removed or shut down, any data that's not in the image is destroyed. And again, we're talking about images next. I know that, that I mentioned that a lot, but uh, it was hard to decide which one to say first. Now, container is only as powerful as its host. Uh, you can do a lot with them, but if you have an old Raspberry Pi, you're not going to want to try to containerize a full Ubuntu 20.4 on it. 
Uh, and a container is limited by what's in the image. There's no more and no less functionality than what's in the Docker file or the image definition. So uh, we're going to start a container. Right? The easiest way to do that, and hopefully it's easy, is Docker container. I'm sorry. There's a container called Hello World. So let me expand this just a little bit here. Maybe. Okay, let's do that. Again. Wonderful, it's not showing. So what should be showing here, but for some reason isn't being shared to that screen, is that not here, just send it over for now. I ran Docker run hello world and it started up the container. Hello from Docker. To generate this message, Docker client contacted the daemon, pulled the hello world image, which I already had on my system because I've been practicing this talk a lot. Uh, the Docker daemon created a new container and the Docker daemon streamed that output to the client, which sent it to the terminal. So if we were to run, what the heck was that? Docker container, ls, we'll see that we have the container running with a random spring ID using the image hello world. And the name, these are randomly generated. Uh, so I didn't choose the name Angry Wilbur, but I love the name Angry Wilbur. So that's pretty cool. Um, but that's how easy it is to spin up a container. Pull this back. All right, so images. Images are an immutable set of instructions that define containers, and these are defined by Docker files. Um, and these are built with the command docker build. They are built on layers, so each command in a Docker file creates a new layer, and these layers can be used for debugging if something goes wrong when you're trying to build a new image. They are read-only. Uh, it's a fully defined set of instructions. You can't change an image without creating a new image. And it defines exactly what a container needs to run. Everything that happens in the Docker file is what's going to be used in the container you're building. So, I'm going to make an image. So we're going to start with a Docker file, which is what I've got open here. And we need to start with the from command. Can you see that all right? The from up there? Okay. Just making sure because it's kind of bright in here. And, and from that, it's going to be from whatever base image we choose. And there are a ton of base images, but I'm just going to go simple. Ubuntu. So this is going to use the Ubuntu image that's available, and it's going to start from that and build off of it. So if we want to do something else, give it another command. And we're going to do something very simple here. And run echo hello world. Right, so I'm going to save this container. I'm sorry, this Docker file. And fix this.
Now to build that, we run Docker build. I'm going to call it Hello Florida. Uh, that's the tag. That's what the dash T means. We're tagging it. We're going with uh, version 1.0.0. And the dot there means that we're going to be in the current folder. You don't have to put Docker file, the name of Docker file, because Docker assumes that. So when we run that, it's going to build and not going to show up there. So let me toss this one back over. So I ran it, it built in 0.9 seconds, it's a very small thing. It's going to take a little bit longer if you don't already have the Ubuntu image on your system. It'll have to pull that down, download it to build it. Um, but you can see step one is from. It's pulling that and we have that cache, so that went pretty quick. Then number two, run hello world. So is Docker something you download or is it just something you run off the internet? It, you can do both, but uh, it's good to have a Docker client at least on your system. Um, if you have a Mac, Docker Desktop will install the Docker command line as well when you run it. I can't speak for Windows. Uh, for Linux, it can be installed natively. You don't need a desktop client if you don't want it. But then we can see that uh, it named it here. Gave us an option to run vulnerability check and now well, since I've got it here, I can show you that I've got the image Hello Florida version 1.0.0. Okay, so let me bring this back over, maybe. Okay, so any, any questions on images? I mean, that was a very, very simple example. Um, they can be a lot more complicated than that, but you can do pretty much anything, uh, including having folders in the same base folder as your Docker file and run commands based on what's in that folder, which will then put whatever's in the folder that you need, in the external folders into the image as it's built. Does that make sense? How do you use it? The image? That's uh, when you, uh, actually that is a good. Because we were trying to, to download or use and load and use a menu server image on Windows. And it didn't work well. All right, so to use an image, um, you use Docker run again. Uh, and then I'm naming the container Florida container, but by having this Hello Florida 1.0.0 behind it, that means that we're going to be using that image in there. So by running this container and the the bin bash is just something I was toying around with when I was working on this. Let me see if I got a. There we go. So yeah, Docker run, hello Florida, and it's going to give it a random name. There we are. It ran it, it created uh, Ubuntu, if I were to run. Maybe it'll work, maybe it'll just... Maybe it won't, okay. It's not wanting to agree with me here. So you're trying to see what's in it? Yeah, just to show that this okay. is a, a base install of Ubuntu that we have access to. Do you need a client to, to use a container or an image? Yeah. Just that way. Okay. 
but if I go up here to individual containers, mm -hmm. we've got Hello Florida here and it stopped since I exited out of it. Yeah. Okay. And it's back over. All right, so did that kind of answer your question at least? Um, make things a little bit clearer or? Okay. What are some practical uses? So, yeah. like backing up, you know, so if you have a site, you're both in the land environment, you're on a way to the team, mm -hmm. you back up that whole environment, you know, is, is that one thing? Or, you know, um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. I don't want to spoil <laughs> spoil the ending, but yeah, there, there are a lot of, I mean, you could really use it for whatever. Uh, then I know that's that sounds like a cop out response, but. Um, there, you can do a ton with it because there are a ton of images available that you can pull down. But uh, I was <coughs> reading somewhere that Docker is for development and not for the production. Um, I mean, because I can't imagine how you, because uh, you say, ah, you can spin up a container and uh, like it's, it's, it's existing only when it's existing. Well, like it's I'm, very virtual. Uh, like imaginary uh, thing. Yeah. But you can't, I mean, you want some kind of stability if you have a production. And that's where uh, stuff like Kubernetes gets into play, which is more containerized stuff, definitely beyond the scope of this. Mm -hmm. um, so Kubernetes is not in scope? Well, no. not in the scope of what I'm talking about today. No, it is not. No. No. Uh, because but the uh, Kubernetes is a kind of orchestration of. Right. I suggest um, for that talk to the Platform SH people because they Platform SH is built if, if I remember correctly it's built on containers. Yeah. So you can push up to your containers. It'll deploy that based on what changes you make, and that uses something we're going to talk about in a little bit to do that. Because but Platformish, they, it's their storage because I'm very much concerned about storage. And that's exactly well, what the next slide is. Okay. <laughs> no problem. So, like I said before, containers are volatile, mm -hmm. like yeah. we were just talking about. Yeah. They don't persist once a container stops, but the Docker does have methods for creating persistent storage, and those are volumes and bind mounts. Yeah. Um, so volumes, they are persistent storage. Unlike containers, they don't disappear. They, they stay there, and they can be shared between multiple containers. So the example that I have here for me to remember is if you have a Gatsby app. I don't know if you're familiar with Gatsby JS. Yeah. It's a node-based uh, static site generator. But when you're developing on it, you want to run npm run develop, which will start yeah. up the Gatsby develop server. That runs off of an express um, node.js server. Uh, when you build it, you want to serve it from Apache. So you can have one single volume that is mounted to both of those containers. And when you're serving from Apache, it's yeah. uh, going from the public folder when you're serving from yeah. the Node.js, it's coming from the, the cache folder. Yeah. So that, uh, they can be shared and get into how they're shared a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, they do take up space on the host machine because it's got to live somewhere. We can't just uh, make imaginary <laughs> storage appear. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And they need to be mounted. Yeah. If a volume isn't properly mounted to a container, then it's not going to be used. You're just going to have it there taking up space. So let's um, create a volume really quick. If my live share isn't working. And that's as simple as Docker volume create and name it whatever. So since I held a gator today, it's going to be Gator City. Now if I run Docker volume you can see here I've got a lot of uh, volumes running but you can see it created this volume here. Now it's not really doing much because it's not uh, bound to anything. We'll get into how to bind it in. Uh, a lot of that is just with the Docker, uh, Docker run volume mount and then name the volume that you want to run with it. Uh, 
Also going to get into a way to kind of make things work a little bit better using Docker Compose, but we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. And now bind mounts, what they are is they link to folders from the host machine. Now this is huge uh, because you can have files in a bind mount and it'll work both ways. It's two-way communication. So the changes in a file, if you change it on your host, it's reflected in the container. Uh, so any updates can be done without having to SSH into uh, a virtual machine or something like that. It's very good for shared projects because a project can be pulled down with Git or version control of your choice, spun up with multiple developer accounts, and each one will have the same data from the Git repository. So if you have a GitHub pro a project on GitHub with a Docker file or a Docker Compose file, which again, we'll talk about Docker Compose in a minute, um, you can spin that up. Everybody will have the same starting point with the code. You could you know, do your feature branch off of that and still run your environment. Uh, locally and it'll match other developers and the reason that is is because the tools are defined by the image Did you have another question? Yeah, but when, uh, okay when the, the tools are defined by the image, but the data from the host is used so the image will give you uh, You know the operating system the Ubuntu or whatever the version of PHP uh, Apache whatever it is that you need to use but the data is coming straight from GitHub in the repo where other developers are working. Now, what was your question? Yeah, but you have, uh, uh, when you want to spin up or create a volume, you have basically, you have to basically define what kind of storage you use. It will default to... Um, Something, but yeah. you have to define the default when you uh, arrange or when you install them or, or when you it design your system. For example, if I don't want to, to go to platform -ish, or if I don't want to go to S3 mm -hmm. or something, I have a menu in, uh, in house and then I want to have Docker containers on that. Okay. Does it work? It should. I mean, it should. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, like I haven't seen your system, so I can't no, tell you 100%. But, but I mean, if, if you have as object storage somewhere, mm -hmm. we can store containers or uh, co to connect to S3 or the object oh. storage locally. I, I don't know about S3. I don't want to okay. say yes or no to that. And okay. if I gave you an answer, it. 50% okay. wrong, it's going to be wrong. Yeah, but what kind of storage are we uh, talking about here? Uh, file system. File system? Yes, so this okay. is uh, you know, saving the files if you want to make changes to, uh, say that you pull down um, the default Ubuntu, the image that yeah. we, we did from yeah. earlier. Yeah. And it, I don't know what version of PHP it ships with right now, it might be 7.4, but for some reason you want to use 7, or you want to use 8.0. Uh, yeah, so you can create a volume for that user uh, for whatever folder mm -hmm. that uh, PHP lives in, mm -hmm. mount it, and mm -hmm. then run, uh, you know, sudo apt get PHP 8 and okay. pull it down. And because that's in a volume, when you spin down that container, yeah. it will still exist. So you'll still have PHP if you spin it back up. Now that's a really bad example because you just pull down a yeah. version of, with PHP in it. Yeah. That you want, but um, the it makes it so that any changes to your containers are persistent across restarts. Okay, but we we were talking about file system. Right, and that's yeah. what a volume and bind mounts yeah. do. Yeah. And the difference between the volume and the bind mount is that this will actually go to, or this mirrors what's on your host machine. So okay. if you've got um, a web project that you have, say, in your Docker projects folder and you know, you've got an index HTML just sitting there and you want to serve it, you mount that folder specifically to bar www HTML in, a, in an Ubuntu or in an Apache container and then because that's mounted, it was a bind mount, if you make a change to index HTML in the outside of the container just on your host machine and save, it's going to change the one inside the host machine so you'll save the same changes. Okay. Uh, and that'll be persistent because it's on your host machine. Sorry. And uh, with Macs, there is a bit of an issue. It's getting better because there was uh, NFS 
file system sharing yeah. amounts. And Mac has its own OSX FS, which I I have several thoughts about. It's not great. It's getting better. But now with the new M1s, with new file system, and I I think it's like GPRC fuse uh, file system mounts. It's getting a lot faster for that. Right. So just traditionally, if it's not native Linux, the the mounts, the file system is going to be slow yeah. compared to native Linux. Uh, what's host in this context? How do you define the host? Um, that gets the into... Different host is used. The host is your computer. This computer here, yeah. outside of the container. Okay. So, that, that's what I mean by host machine. And uh, the, the container is a virtualized environment. So the host is this thing, mm -hmm. uh, everything running native to this. Okay. So, on, on my host machine, I have a client and I can create volume. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, I can create volume somewhere else, uh, connect with the NFS or something else. Yeah, depending on how you have uh, yeah. everything okay. set up. the volume there. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. And, okay, so next thing we're going to get to is Docker services, and it looks like we're getting close to time, so I'm going to rush through a little bit. So Docker services are connected containers with a common goal. A single service is a single container, but it works with other services to form an application. And it's usually part of a larger application. Several services can be used for a single applica application. Um, each service is defined by a Docker file. Yeah? I just want to note that there's a half hour between the first and second session, so okay. I, you don't have to I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so each individual service is defined by a Docker file, uh, but those Docker files are pulled with Docker Compose, which is a utility that orchestrates an entire application rather than just a single container at a time. And those are defined in a Docker Compose.yaml file. Um, so for example, I work with Doxel. I'm a Doxel maintainer, uh, so I'm going to talk it up. Uh, but it has multiple services available. If you do a what we call the default stack that's going to be uh, MySQL, Apache, PHP, um, and the CLI, or you know, the host, or sorry, the remote machine, the CLI that you can interact with is the PHP container. So it has those, all three containers separate, has the volumes, which in this case are bind mounts uh, connected to it, and has networking through a few, networking, the host proxy, and the DNS server, which are all three separate services that are shared. So all of those work together to create one, one application, and you could create multiple of those. Uh, so that's instead of you know, using our Ubuntu example, pulling down an Ubuntu image, going into that container, and then running apt-get Apache, apt-get PHP, apt-get MySQL, and trying to run everything there. Instead, we containerize everything, we keep it simple, we uh, put them all together, let them work together. Um, and we can change individual parts as we need. So I'm going to open up a Docker Compose file real quick and walk through it. Find the that's the opposite of what I want to do. Okay. All right. So. This is a Docker Compose YAML file. Um, if we walk through it, and it's easier than using the cursor. So the version here, 3.9, that's just the Docker Compose API version. 3.9 is the most common, you'll see version 2, 2.1. Uh, it just tells Docker Compose what's available when running the commands. Now the services directive here, we've got two services that are being defined. We've got database, or DB, and CLI. Now, that's going to be the name of the service as we uh, as we start it up. Each of those pulls down its own image. Um, uh, we'll talk about repositories in a second, but each of those has its own image. These come from Docker files that define what the image are, image is, and then each of these has its own volume. Now, this volume is going to be mounted within the service to bar with MySQL for MySQL. This one is going to have site data 
we're going to have stuff available in part of www.html, but we're not going to be changing anything in the OS itself or the container itself. We're just making that folder available so that we can make changes and it's safe. If we accidentally shut down Docker, we don't lose everything. The other one here is the ports. Um, if you don't define ports or if you don't expose ports, Docker will assign its own port. So if, you, if there's something that you want to connect with networking uh, and you want to know what the port's going to be, you have to define it. And the, the syntax here is host container. So port 80 on the container is going to be mapped to port 8000 when you try to connect to it from the host. So for example, if you went to localhost dot, or just localhost colon 8000, that'll go into the container at port 80, which is normal, Apache, unsecure. And then down here, to create a volume in Docker Compose, all you have to do is name it, or put it in the volumes bracket. You don't have to put anything unless you want to get fancy with it, but just doing this creates the volumes that can be called up here. So by running Docker Compose uh, build with this, it'll create the containers, it'll let them work together as an application rather than separate, uh, separate containers. So does that make sense where things orchestrate? Yeah. This YML file, mm -hmm. it's in the client. No, this would be on your host machine because you oh, run no. um, you run Docker Compose yeah. commands with it. All right, let's go back to the slides. All right, so the registries, I've mentioned those a lot. I've also mentioned pulling down images. Registries are where images are stored. They're defined, they're built on a system, whether it be a local machine, you know, your, your host machine that you have in front of you, whether you have some kind of deployment, CI, CD uh, pipeline, they're built and then they're deployed up to a registry. The most common of this is Docker Hub or hub.docker.com. Um, and any image on a registry can be extended. Uh, and that's so that you can create custom images like we we did with the Docker file from Ubuntu that pulled down the Ubuntu image from Docker Hub. Uh, and there's also a an image called Scratch so that if you don't want to have a base image, you start from Scratch. And let's see if, then you can do whatever you want to in there. I mean, <coughs> Should auto complete here. <coughs> and if you can't see that, it's a, the name of the base image is, uh, well, that's not what I wanted. Wanted it. That should give me a <coughs> tool tip, but it's not going to. Well, anyway, it's it's a blank image. There's nothing to it. If you want to start an image with absolutely nothing defining anything before you get started, you go from scratch. It also, um, with images or with registries, you can have custom and private registries. You don't have to use Docker Hub. If you've got containers or images that you want within your organization, you can set up your own registry to pull down from that. So we're gonna go back to that image from the beginning. And I'm hoping that it makes a little bit more sense now. Uh, so the way that it goes, we've got our client, this is gonna be what we work with on the command line. If we run those commands, it's gonna connect to the daemon and say we're doing docker pull or docker run. If we're doing docker run Ubuntu, we're gonna check, we're gonna connect to the daemon with that command. It's gonna check, oh, we've got Ubuntu already there. Let's spin up a container. However, if we do, I think that's the icon for Redis. Anybody know if I'm completely wrong there? If not, I'm just going to go with it. Um, if we do Docker pull or Docker run Redis, mm -hmm. going to look. See, we don't have it here, so it's going to go up to Docker Hub, pull it down, create an image, and then that will create a container. So does that make sense now compared to when I showed it before? Who maintains Docker Hub? Uh, Docker. It, uh, Docker itself is open source software. Docker Desktop is closed source that they're charging. Uh, 
based on usage right now for larger companies. But Docker itself is open source. It's a company? Docker. Yeah. So why even use Docker? Um, valid question, because why use that instead of your local dev environment? Or, you know, the MAMP, the WAMP, the LAMP, or uh, having a virtual machine, Vagrant, VirtualBox. And for the purpose of this, the local dev environment is something like MAMP or WAMP, just, just for the sake of argument. Well, we're gonna compare three things here, reusability, portability, and configurability. So reusability. Local dev environments are great, but not really reusable. They require additional setup for each project. So for example, if you have a couple of clients, one of them's on Pantheon, one of them's on Acquia, different versions of PHP, different versions, MariaDB versus MySQL. Anytime you switch between those clients, you have to change the settings. Otherwise, you're gonna have that, well, it worked on my machine problem. So that could be time consuming, it could be tedious, uh, something that you don't really wanna deal with. However, virtual machines, they're reusable, but they're more resource intensive. When you spin up a virtual machine, I'm glad that I have props here. When you spin up a virtual machine, you create this in your computer, an entire system from the hardware up. For containerized environments, they can be reused on multiple systems, multiple users, multiple projects, and no matter, this means that no matter where a project's loaded, it'll have the same setup as everywhere else from the initial install. Now portability, local dev environments, not portable at all. Uh, they require setup on each machine where the project's gonna live. Virtual machines are portable, but to be portable, they're very large. Um, has anybody worked with VirtualBox at all? Uh, VirtualBox, it's a virtual machine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so to spin up a virtual machine, you need something like an ISO file, which could be tens of gigabytes to pull down, depending on what all is installed. And you have to have one of those for each machine that you spin up or recreate with the same one. Uh, so yeah, it's portable, but it's also very resource intensive. Containers, completely portable, and the only requirement is that a developer have Docker. So this makes it so you don't have to keep multiple VMs, VM tools like Vagrant, VirtualBox, you don't have to keep those installed. Excuse me. And you don't have to have multiple versions of the same thing in your post machine storage, so you don't have to have all versions of PHP going back to 5.6. Uh, just need to have the container, we'll have everything in it. And third one is configurability. Local dev environments are just difficult to configure on a per project basis. Yeah? Just, I'm sorry, just a question on the back, the last slide there. So compared to say VirtualBox or something like that, they are beefy, bulky, when you, you set those up and define, out of my 64 gigs of memory, I'm allocating 16 of it. Mm -hmm. It's earmarked for this, and it's kind of preserved, and you're taking your best guess. And as you grow, you might have to rebuild, restart, recreate the whole thing. Right. Does Docker dynamically allocate necessary resources like memory, CPU, stuff like that? Or do you also have to predefine those? No, real quick, let me see if I can get this. OK. So I can't really make this much larger, but I will um, try to explain what I'm seeing. I'm just wondering if it, if it intuitively uses the host resources as it needs them. You can set a max limit. Like your hello world should use yeah. nothing, right? There's right. Nothing happening it's there. not going to um, take up everything that you give it. You see, like this one, I have four CPUs available, six gigs of memory, two gigs of swap space, and 32 gigs available for data image. I know it's hard to see from back there, so right, that's why I'm good. But you know, I have 32 gigs allocated, but only 18.7 gigs are used. And that's not the Hello World image. That's <laughs> everything that I have running on here. And I've got quite a few things stored in various images and uh, volumes. So yeah, it. So, so if you were to spin up a giant, uh, I want to use my word carefully, a container that's running a whole bunch of my SQL databases, a whole bunch of things, would that dramatically go down? Would it? Would it fluctuate? It, it's only going to go as high as the resources that you say it can have. Um, with, so you do, you do have to still redefine boundaries? Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a problem a couple years ago with 
Docker desktop for Mac and what was called the QCOW2 file, where it would just eat memory and eat storage and it would continue to grow. And if you wanted to get that st storage back, you had to clear out all your volumes and images and start from scratch. That's not a problem anymore using a completely different file uh, setup. But um, with your example, uh, that one container would probably be split into 17 different containers just based on how many. Uh, and the nice thing is if you have a virtual machine and you want to change the PHP version, you've got to turn off that machine, spin it back up, and rebuild it, which can take a bit of time. If you have a, and I think this is what I have in my notes here, if I could get back to that browser. Well, with VirtualBox now, you can upgrade it and just save the new snapshot of the... Like, right. But if you need to make multiple changes uh, for some reason with Docker, that container, if you have, uh, if you're using Docker Compose or even just Docker itself, you can make one single change. I'm going to use Docker Compose as an example because it's um, it's more useful than just Docker. You don't really have many cases where you just need one container if you're doing development. Right. Um, but if you need to change your PHP version, you change one thing, and the only thing that resets is going to be that PHP container. Everything else just keeps on running as it is. So. You know, just a matter of seconds to uh, to get that spun back up. Now, because I like pictures, these are I've got two comparison images here. Of the virtual machines. We've got the infrastructure. We'll call that the host machine. Hypervisor allows for virtualization, and then each of them are going to have a full operating system, the app, and that's going to be each one a virtual machine. All right, so every time they have one spending, it's going to be the entire computer. Like I said, that thing right there is each one of these. Whereas containers, we've got six apps here, all using Docker, which is allocating the resources from the host operating system as needed for each of the containers. So we don't have to spin up an operating system for each one of these. It's sharing. Uh, so this is kind of mislabeled as either host operating system or the virtual machine that Docker desktop creates. But you kind of understand what you're getting at, right? So yeah, it just uses the resources that are available. Docker allocates that for Linux containers. Uh, and we have several apps spinning up using the same setup. All right, I've got like two or three more slides that I'm just going to rush through. So if we go beyond Docker, there are a couple alternatives to Docker because, as I mentioned before, Docker is now charging for uh, commercial usage for companies over 250 employees and not or and revenue of $10 million or more a year. Um, so people are looking for alternatives. The alternatives, I haven't really tried them, but I know they exist, are Podman, uh, which is from Red Hat. I, I might know one or two people who work over there. Um, Lima, I haven't tried that. I know it exists and Rancher Desktop. They all work with Linux containers. Podman says it's a drop-in replacement for Docker, but I haven't tried it, so I don't want to give opinions. Do your own research, see if any of them will work for you. And pre-configured environments, uh, like I said, Doxel, Lando's another one you'll hear a lot. DDEB is something that you'll hear like 15 times if you talk to Mike Anello for 10 seconds, he'll mention it nonstop. Um, each of these are set up to do web development. And you can spin up a project. They're all services. Uh, Doxel, I am a Doxel maintainer, so if you ask me my opinion, Doxel's great, everything else is crap, but <laughs> that's just me. Uh, the other ones, they all have their, their pros and cons. And uh, PDEV is from Acquia? Yeah. No. Yeah. It's independent. Yeah. It used to have a, it used it to have a company behind it, but now it's all developer driven. Yeah, I, all three of these are volunteer based. Uh, you know, we have a small team for Doxel. We're all giving our free time to it to put it together. Same with Lando. Well I think I don't know if Mike is making money off of that. And not Mike and Ella. And DDEV, I don't know who does that, but it's Randy Fay right now for DDEV and okay. Lando Is it still Mike Perot? Mike Pierrot and Alex Pierrot. and John Alex still. Okay. All right, so seriously two two more slides. I'm sorry it's going over a bit. Containerization has come a long way. Uh, more and more apps are using it and moving away from virtual machines. And as I mentioned before, I think one of you asked if it's just for development. It's not just for development. Um, a lot of cool things can be done. I had I found an app that was only available for Linux, but I wanted to use it on my Mac. So what I ended up doing was creating a containerized uh, Ubuntu environment 
running it on my Mac, running the app on my Mac, being able to network with uh, a Raspberry Pi to do something cool. I don't want to get into the details of it, but I was able to run that just as if it was native by building something with the container. So you can do a lot with it. Uh, I would give time for questions, but we're already over. So if you have questions, let me know out there after I breathe for a bit. And thank you all for coming. It's it's so good to be back. Can you go back to that slide that puts a pod man? Yeah. Over there? Okay. Yeah, pod man uh, is Red Hat. Lima, I don't know who does that, but Rancher Desktop is Rancher IO. It, uh, but it's supposed to be, it's an electron app that really looks a lot like Docker desktop, only it's open source and free. And at its core, it does use Lima. I think Lima creates a, vir a Linux virtual machine, much like what Docker desktop is supposed to do. Uh, there's documentation on all of it. Podman, there, there, as far as I know. There's a lot of new articles on Podman on opensource.com. We're doing a series right now on that. So. And it's a perfect time for that with Docker mm -hmm. you know, bringing the hammer down. Right. All right. Thank you all Thank so much you. for coming. I'm going to press the button again.